First of all, I should thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I don't really work on uh, laser plasma accelerators, to be honest, but um, I think I was invited mainly because I collaborate a lot with uh, GIFR, and I've been doing it for quite a few years now. Um, so I'm going to be telling you um, about the work that I do, at least some of it. Um, I work a lot on inertial confinement fusion. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is something particular though, I mean I do a variety of different things with inertial fusion. I'm going to talk about uh, hydrodynamics driven by intense short pulse lasers. I realize that uh, some of you probably don't have very much familiarity with inertial fusion, so I'll start off with a few slides telling you about that. Uh, and then having done that, I'll go on and talk about my main topic. Also, since this is a uh, laser plasma accelerator conference, I've managed to find two slides that I can credibly talk about to some degree on laser plasma accelerators from a, a paper that um, a couple of the other academics at my university, the University of York, are, are working on, and I've had some peripheral involvement with, but uh, at least it uh, relates to the topic. Okay, so um, some acknowledgements to start off with. Uh, this work, a lot of it's experimental, so uh, a lot of people have been involved. Not just the people mentioned on this slide. Uh, I'll mention some other people as the talk goes on. Uh, of course, quite a few people from York, including some of my students, also some students uh, belonging to other people, if that's the right way to put it. Uh, my colleagues at York, these here. Uh, quite a lot of people from GAFR, who I've been collaborating with now since 2009. Um, and also quite a lot of people at the Rutherford African Laboratory, which is, uh, the, the Rutherford is essentially um, a laboratory in the UK where we have our larger facilities that can't be uh, readily purchased by a single university. And also there's quite a lot of other people from elsewhere, but I I can't mention them all on this slide. Okay, so as I say, I'm going to start off with a short introduction to inertial uh, fusion. Uh, sometimes people call this inertial confinement fusion. Sometimes people call this inertial fusion energy. And to some degree, what the object of the research is, but uh, I'll call it both and confuse you by doing so, perhaps, but I apologize. Um, so this is what ICF is. Um, so what we do is we Start off with a spherical capsule. It has three distinct regions. I'm afraid my hand isn't quite steady enough to point at these with the laser pointer, so I'll use my finger. Um, the outermost region is what we call the ablator. Um, you could think of this as being a little bit like rocket fuel, but unlike rocket fuel, it doesn't actually um, contain the energy it needs to expand. That comes from an external driver, uh, which is typically either laser photons or soft X-rays, which is gen being generated uh, by a high-power laser or possibly by some other mechanism, such as a Z-pinch or Z-pinch, if you're American. Uh, then inside this outermost region, we have these, this region that's indicated blue and yellow. They're both deuterium tritium. Uh, it's held at its triple point, so this is a cryogenic target. Um, the innermost region, the blue region, that's deuterium uh, tritium gas. The yellow region, that's deuterium tritium ice. Okay, so you expose this thing to your driver. Um, the orange layer, the ablator, it's not really orange, by the way, um, typically made out of some low atomic number material, such as plastic or beryllium. And the outermost layer of that gets very hot. It expands, and you get a rocky reaction to this, which is uh, the implosion of the rest of the target. And so the objective here is essentially to accelerate this shell of uh, deuterium tritium ice uh, to a very high velocity. And then when it slams into itself in the middle, uh, you achieve both a very high density and a very high temperature right in the very middle. Um, so this thing isn't heated uniformly. What tends to happen is the region that was originally the gas fill, that kind of gets compressed by the shell collapsing around it, a little bit like a piston in the diesel engine. Uh, so that rises up to a temperature of maybe around 100 million Kelvin. Uh, 
the surrounding fuel, the denser fuel, that's compressed from the initial density of this material in tritium ice of about 0.22 grams per cubic centimeter up to around about 1,000 grams per cubic centimeter. So this is roughly a 4,000 4, times or 5,000 times compression of a solid. And if you've done it all right, um, the, you get some, let me just move this microphone a bit because it seems to change the volume a great deal depending where I'm talking. Um, so depending on uh, if you've done it right or not, uh, then the alpha particles from some fusion reactions which have been heated in this hottest central region, which as I said is a temperature around 100 minutes Kelvin, uh, will then get redeposited in that hot fuel in a period of around 10 picoseconds, that centermost region heats up from around 100 million Kelvin to maybe 7 or 800 million Kelvin. And then the burn wave propagates out into the surrounding dense fuel. So that's basically what we're trying to do. And in the conventional approach, uh, we try and achieve the heating and also the compression, um, sorry, the, the heating and the compression of high density just using this implosion process. Um, so this is the main machine that exists at the moment for doing this. This is the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, its main mission is stockpile stewardship. It's, uh, a kind of a science mission it has trying to achieve uh, ignition by this process. Ignition is basically deemed to be achieved when you get this rapid self-heating of the central region, which doesn't necessarily mean that you get as much energy out as you put in, uh, but it does show you that uh, the process that we need is essentially working. Okay, so the way that this thing's work, this is a target chamber, it's about 10 meters in diameter. This is I'm told, or at least it was at the time, the world's largest crane. Uh, so it's lowering the target chamber into position. The way this thing basically works is that uh, the capsule here, this is a tiny American coin, about a centimeter across, so this gives you some sense of scale. Uh, this tiny capsule, spherical capsule here in the middle, uh, gets the entire energy of this enormous laser, which has stored energy of about 1.9 megajoules, uh, in about 20 billionths of a second. Uh, this thing works by what's known as indirect drive, which is to say that the uh, lasers don't directly strike the surface of the fuel capsule, but they're first converted into soft X-ray energy by being incident on the inside of this thing called a hole ram. It's basically just a black body oven, so the lasers go in, they heat it up, it radiates roughly uh, with a Planckian black body emission curve across the, the actual real opacity of the material. And these soft x-rays then illuminate the surface of the capsule and everything is the same as I just told you. Um, so uh, thanks to the pesky Rayleigh-Taylor instability, this thing doesn't quite work yet. And it's a question mark whether it actually will work with the laser this big. They may have needed to build it about one and a half times bigger. But they might be able to find a way still to, to wangle it to actually ignite. If you actually want to generate energy, though, you've got to do a lot more than what they're trying to do on the NIF. The NIF can only fire at best about two or three times a day. In practice, they normally only fire it at most once a day. Um, if you want to actually generate power, you have to explode a series of these capsules at a rate of maybe between about 0.1 and 10 hertz, depending on how large the individual capsules are and how big a bang they make. So we need quite a high repetition rate laser or whatever driver you're using. You could also potentially use ion beams or some pulse power system. Uh, then you capture the energy which comes off principally as neutrons. You can also breed some more tritium uh, from those neutrons by interactions with lithium in the wall. And everything else is pretty much the same as a conventional power station. So you use the, the heating from the neutrons in, on, on the chamber wall. Uh, to create steam, that drives a turbine, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so that's all very well, but in order to get uh, ignition by this scheme, you need a very, very large laser. And actually, the process of heating the fuel up by uh, this very violent compression is highly inefficient, it's less than 1% efficient, in fact. Um, so another approach to ICF is what they call fast ignition, where they basically decouple the process of compression, which is 
pretty much what I just told you, except that you uh, accelerate the capsule rather more gently so that you don't drive such uh, strong shock waves into it, which means that you don't heat up the central region quite so much. So essentially, you waste less energy in heating the fuel, but you still manage to drive it to a similar density. And of course, it gets a bit easier to get it to that density if you don't have to heat it as much, uh, because if you just compress something, it just remains relatively cold. So having compressed the fuel, you then come along with another very high intensity laser. And um, there are a variety of ways in which you could potentially couple that energy from the laser into this dense fuel. But ideally, we think you probably want to use electrons with an energy of around about 1 MeV. Um, and we think you can probably achieve a rather higher heating efficiency in this way, maybe of around 10% or something like that with a bit of luck. Um, so this is another approach to ICF, although compared to the conventional approach, it's relatively inefficient. OK, so that was the kind of introductory bit, which I really just put in for, for people who might be in the audience who don't know very much about ICF, so that they can follow the rest of the talk reasonably well. Um, so what I'm actually going to talk about um, in this seminar today is uh, I'm going to talk about hydrodynamic hydrodynamics, I can say the word, uh, driven by short uh, laser pulses. Um, so we can split this type of hydrodynamic behavior into two classes. So uh, first of all, you get the type of hydrodynamics that you may hear quite a bit about if you're talking about laser plasma accelerators, which is basically hydro driven directly by the laser. So this is all boring light phenomena, radiation, pressure acceleration, that kind of thing. Um, and then you also get hydrodynamics, which is driven indirectly by the pressure gradients which have been uh, created and then sent up by the laser. Um, and it's more the latter, actually, that I'll be talking about, even though the former may be more relevant to this workshop. It's not really what I do so much. Um, and this has some relevance to inertial fusion energy, particularly for the fast ignition approach um, in the following areas. Uh, it's relevant to how the hot spot disassembles in fast ignition. So you consider this system here. Um, in the conventional uh, approach to ICF, the fuel actually kind of reaches its peak temperature and density by a process of hydrodynamic stagnation. So this dense shell collapses down around the gas fill um, until the two roughly come into a pressure balance. So this is sometimes called an isobaric ignition approach. Uh, with fast ignition, on the other hand, you collapse your fuel and then you've got a dense blob of fuel, and you come along and you heat it up uh, in a very short period of time, maybe less than 10 picoseconds, uh, with a high intensity laser, which means that your hot spot relative to your surrounding fuel is certainly not in uh, hydrodynamic uh, equilibrium. Uh, the hot spot pressure may be several hundred times higher than that, than that of the surrounding fuel, which means it will explode very violently. Um, so, this is uh, one of the things that you might want to understand. Um, in addition, as is shown in this little illustration here, there's one approach to fast ignition where you, there's a problem essentially with fast ignition, which is that once you've collapsed the fuel down, you, this dense fuel that you're trying to heat up is very, very much denser than the, um, the critical uh, density for the laser, which means that your laser can't easily get anywhere near that very dense fuel. You either have to bore through a lot of coronal plasma, or you have to do something else. And the something else that's most commonly proposed is that you start off with a target that has got a great big cone, often made out of gold, but that's just mainly because gold's easy to fabricate, stuffed into the side of it. And then once the thing's compressed, you fire your ultra high intensity laser down the axis of the cone, uh, meaning that your hot electrons are generated near to where you need them to be deposited. Um, so this short pulse driven hydrodynamics has relevance to what's going on in that scenario and also in something which you probably won't have heard about, which is what's known as the structured collimator. Uh, a structured collimator is something that you actually put in the tip of this cone um, so that the electrons, when they're <coughs> generated, they don't just all stray out into a, a very large cone angle, uh, but they're actually directed. Um, and the way that you do this is by using uh, resistivity gradients to control uh, the flow of the electrons by setting up uh, magnetic fields inside the tip of the cone. 
but obviously that only works if you can keep your uh, collimating device reasonably intact. And when you're firing a laser with a focus intensity of an excess of 10 to the 20 watts per centimeter squared, things don't tend to remain intact for very long. So uh, what we're trying to do, for instance, is understand how the material will flow and move um, in that very short period of time that it needs to hold together in order to do the job. Um, in addition, more generally in inertia confinement fusion, a lot of the physics uh, that we're interested in is actually relevant uh, to understanding, first of all, just the dynamics of a hot spot in conventional inertia confinement fusion. Um, but also, if you want to do an experiment, a well-controlled experiment, to look at, for instance, material opacity or equation of state, um, you want to find a way to heat up a material whilst it remains relatively uniform in terms of density. You want to be able to heat it up to a very high temperature, and a short pulse laser offers you a way of doing that. Uh, but in order to understand what your target will actually look like at the point where you're trying to do, say, some kind of transmission experiment, you need to understand how the hydrodynamics have evolved up to that point in time. Okay. So, just a little bit more info on a few of those things. So, this is what I'm going on about when I'm talking about cone tip evolution. So, this is a very rudimentary uh, mock up of a cone in shell fast ignition target. Um, so, what we're interested in here is basically the hydro that's happening at the tip of this cone here, so in this region here. Um, and one of the questions that we might want to answer is do we need to really consider magnetohydrodynamics in terms of understanding? of this uh, plasma, or can we pretty much just use a conventional radiation hydrodynamics code, uh, which doesn't really know very much about magnetic fields. Uh, this is a very difficult area to um, investigate experimentally uh, for a couple of reasons, one of which is that in order to get very high, high intensities with a short pulse laser, you can focus it down to a spot size, which may be less than 10 microns in diameter. Pulses are also, of course, extremely short, typically less than um, a picosecond, sometimes only a few tens of femtoseconds. seconds. So you're going to need a diagnostic that has extremely high temporal and spatial resolution uh, in order to be able to make measurements of the sort that we will need in order to benchmark any hydrodynamic simulations that we do. Um, so we did a actually almost by accident, some early experiments in this area quite a while ago um, at the Vulcan facility, the Vulcan Petawatt facility, uh, the Rutherford lab. And we found that we could uh, potentially, using the Vulcan Petawatt drive, a uh, shock wave uh, with a pressure of around one gigabar, which is quite an impressive shock wave for, for those of you who aren't particularly familiar with shock wave physics. This is far above the kind of pressures that you would normally be driving with, say, a long pulse laser system, which is typically what is used for shockwave studies. Now, there are many problems in using um, short pulse lasers for doing shockwave experiments in the laboratory. Um, the main ones being that typically what you do if you want to do a well-controlled shockwave experiment in the lab, you get a long pulse laser, um, you apply some pulse shaping, so it basically has a flat top profile around, rather than the Gaussian shape, and then you use some uh, clever optics, basically the phase plates, uh, to, tr to ensure that your uh, spot is also very uniform spatially, so that you have a, a drive that's spatially very uniform and also temporally. You can't really do that with a short pulse laser because you don't really have the capable capability to do it at the moment. So whilst this is kind of fun, it will be very difficult to do an equation of state experiment with this kind of shock wave. Um, but anyway, we found out that you can generate some quite exciting hydrodynamic conditions um, using a short pulse laser, and this was published in PRL. So this is a collaboration with Livermore and a bunch of other places. Um, then I, a little bit later than that, I got one of my students to do some um, calculations to try and figure out how much we needed to worry about MHD effects. Um, so these are some calculations that we did. Uh, and basically what it tells you is, so, I mean, for a long time, and the, the reason for do, uh, doing a lot of this, it, it helps to have a little historical footnote, maybe. If I went back to about 
2006, 2007, and told people that I was going to do hydro experiments with a short pulse laser, uh, they would have probably told me that I was a bit stupid because the general feeling in the community at that time was that uh, on peak second time scales, basically things don't move. Um, so you don't really need to worry about hydrodynamics on very short time scales. Um, however, as is uh, clearly shown by these calculations, you actually do. Um, if you have enough energy being deposited, uh, so if you are driving a target with a, a laser pulse with a duration of a few picoseconds, as is typical for instance in fast ignition, um, then your energy basically goes into an electron beam. Um, so the hydro is essentially driven by that electron, or the hydro that you're interested in is essentially driven by that electron beam because the laser itself doesn't actually get into the very dense plasma, uh, which is the bit that you're interested in. Uh, so we, we looked at, we did some calculations looking with an MHD code to see uh, how rapidly the plasma would evolve hydrodynamically uh, with current densities of the sort that you would get um, in fast ignition. Actually, in fast ignition, uh, you're kind of somewhere off this corner of this graph, so your current, is, current density is probably about 10 to the 19-ish, and your density units here are rather confusing to be given in kilograms per meter rather than norm, normal grams per centimeter cube, uh, will be somewhere off up here. Uh, but essentially the time, time scale here is how long it takes to form a shock wave. Um, so as you can see, uh, in some conditions you can actually form shock waves on time scales of just a couple of picoseconds. So um, that was firstly quite interesting and also it was quite interesting to note that although there were some small differences between the calculations where the MHD effects turned on and off, they weren't very big, which is reassuring because most of the codes that we use uh, to model ICF targets are just radiation hydrodynamic codes, and they don't uh, properly incorporate magnetic fields. Um, so I guess I can run this using the pointer, I'll have a go. Um, no, I can't. Let me go and point at it with my cursor then. So this is just a little simulation then of uh, what happens when you pass a intense current pulse through uh, a plasma conditions given at the bottom. Play it again. Um, so the main thing I want you to notice here is if you actually look at the, the clock, which is going up here somewhere in this top corner. Let me do it again so you can notice that. See that the hydro here is really evolving on a very, very short time scale. So this is total clock time here goes up to only 20 picoseconds. Okay, so hydro happens on short time scales, having established that. There are some situations in which you don't want hydro to happen on short time scales. And um, one of those is if you're trying to do a reasonably well controlled experiment um, and you actually want to have a well controlled. Uh, for instance, here, well-controlled pressure source. So what we're doing here is we're seeing if we can actually guide um, electrons down this wire. And it's a bit hard to see, but the tip of this wire is actually, maybe if I can draw it on the board, this helps. So what we've got is a kind of a taper at one end of this wire. So the actual shape is something like this. And the laser is coming in on this end. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the temperature that's being produced as you go along the wire. And the point is we showed here that you can actually produce a region here that's maybe about 50 microns long where you can get a relatively uniform temperature inside your wire. And that relatively uni uniform temperature, whilst I wouldn't pay too much um, heed to the exact number, is really quite high. So this is code saying it's 1500 EV. Um, in reality, I'd be very surprised if it was much more than half of that because there's all kinds of physics that isn't actually included in this, such as radiation transport. But uh, anyway, so this is quite a fun uh, idea. If you want to drive an experiment, you want a, a nice high pressure uh, source, which is relatively well controlled. So this is the way to do it. And the way this is working is essentially that you're using resistivity gradients 
um, at this interface between your wire and your surrounding medium to control the flow of electrons from the laser going into this wire. So that you're getting a, rel a relatively collimated beam of electrons going down the wire rather than just spraying out. And you can kind of see what they would do if you look at this background material. You can kind of see this very faint outline of this uh, like cone-like distribution. So that's pretty much what the electrons would do uh, if you didn't have this, uh, this, this guide, guiding structure there. So this is a little bit like the kind of thing that you're trying to do with these structured collimators as well. Too. Okay, so here are some experiments that we actually did uh, or TIFR did, and then we did some modeling for them. Um, and this is looking at trying to measure some of this short pulse hydrodynamics uh, directly in the laboratory. Um, and the idea here is you've got a target, so this is a target over here. You come along and whack it with a um, high intensity laser with an intensity of around 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter squared. Um, and then you come along with a probe, which is at a uh, higher frequency. Uh, so it's been either frequency doubled or frequency tripled uh, using crystals for higher frequency. And you basically bounce that probe laser off the plasma that's been created by this, what we call the pump, so by the, the high intensity laser that's created this plasma. And uh, what you're doing here is essentially just Doppler spectroscopy. So you bounce this thing off um, into a spectrometer and you look at the shift from the center frequency of the probe beam to try and ascertain how the plasma is moving. And of course, you get a little bit more information than you might think maybe if you don't work in plasma physics because your laser will reflect off a very particular density. It will reflect approximately off the critical density. And you can calculate exactly what density it will reflect. So that means that you know that some surface in your plasma has some velocity either towards your probe or away from your probe. So uh, that provides you with some useful information. If you do this at a couple of different frequencies, you can actually get the velocity of two different surfaces in your plasma. And because all of these lasers here have durations on the order of a few tens of femtoseconds, you're getting extremely high temporal resolution. These lasers also have a high repetition rate, this laser at TIFR. Uh, which means that you can do a large number of shots at particular time delays relative to your firing of the main pulse, which means that you can get relatively good statistics uh, as to the plasma evolution. So this was the, the first paper that uh, we worked. So we basically did the simulations and the, the uh, scientists from TIFR did the experiment. Um, so this is the experimental result and uh, this is the experimental result again, and this is our modeling of it. And you can see there's a reasonable, although not exact, quantitative agreement. There is a quite a good qualitative agreement between the two. And so what you can actually see going on here is that early in time, um, if you're looking, you're, let me, well, I'll try and draw it out, try and draw it on the board. Um, So uh, this is basically what your plasma density profile looks like uh, before the main pulse arrives. The reason for this is that uh, these short pulse lasers have associated with them uh, what's known as a pre-pulse. So basically you get some light at a still relatively high intensity uh, before the main pulse arrives, which creates a plasma. So you have a plasma to start off with. So let's say that this is the critical surface for the pump laser, for the, so for the heating laser. So you dump a load of energy about here with your pump laser, and now you get a pressure disturbance moving up here, uh, and also a density perturbation. Um, now your probe laser has a higher frequency, so it reflects off a higher density contour in plasma. So this little disturbance move, moves along in here, moving up the density gradient, passes through here, and as it passes through this critical surface of the probe, it basically knocks that critical surface in. So that's where you get this little peak. And then the plasma basically just relaxes and rarefies back out afterwards. So that's essentially all the hydro that's going on here. Uh, this is the same experiment, uh, again done by TIFR, again modeled by ourselves. Um, this time, so this one was at 400 nanometers. This is now at 266. 
this is now something else. This is an experiment that um, we did. So some people from York and some people from um, the Rutherford lab and also from various other places um, looking at emission from uh, solid targets. So uh, this wasn't meant to be a hydro experiment at all. Uh, actually, what we were trying to look at is how deeply you can heat a target with electrons, and we had some uh, floor layer in these targets, and we were looking at emission lines from this floor layer to try and understand how deeply uh, the heating of the electrons was penetrating the target. Um, but what we found when we did this, uh, we were using relatively low atomic number CH targets, and the floor layer is so thin that it doesn't really make a huge amount of difference, except from the standpoint of the diagnostics that's actually looking at the emission lines from that floor layer. Oh, yeah, these are all the people involved, which can be some big experiment, lots of people involved. Um, what we saw is that when you do XUV imaging of these targets, you get a ring. And you get a ring that's about 100 microns in diameter, which is kind of weird because the focal spot of the laser is about 8 microns across. And if you go back to 2007, 2008, uh, you'll, you would find people at standing up at conferences. You can even find a few papers where people go to great lengths to explain why you get these strange ring-like features in these experiments, basically just looking at electron transport and this kind of thing from the target. Anyway, we realized that actually maybe what's going on here is not an artifact of the electron transport, but an artifact of the hydrodynamics. And uh, so what I mainly do is I actually, I mainly do hydro radiation hydrodynamic simulations. So uh, we did some initially quite low resolution 2D rad hydro calculations uh, of these targets. So first of all, you can't calculate the heating uh, using a rad hydro code because uh, the way that a short pulse laser heats a target, you get a lot, a lot of non-local heating processes that you can't properly incorporate into a radiation hydrodynamics code, or our radiation hydrodynamics code doesn't incorporate those features, let's put it that way. Um, and then we took the output from that uh, code, which is basically a, a particle code, into, your, into the hydro code, and then we took the output from the hydro code and put it into a collisional radiative uh, code to work out what the integrated emission would look like. And what we found is that we get a ring. Not exactly the same diameter as the experiment, but at least it was a lot closer to what you would expect or what you saw in the experiment than what all the electron transport calculation-based explanations were giving. And the reason this works as it does is essentially this. The plasma in the middle gets up to some crazy temperature in excess of 1 keV. And uh, because it's a relatively low Z material, the atoms end up getting completely stripped, which means that you don't get very much emission. However, the surrounding region, uh, what happens is that you actually now drive a shock wave out from this central region, out up here. And the shock wave, as it moves, it very rapidly cools down. So initially, it's very hot and dense. And then as it moves, it cools down. And so what you're actually seeing here is a little bit like a snapshot of this uh, shock wave as it's propagating. Because at some particular point in time, when the density and temperature of this shock wave uh, give a nice bright signal in the, uh, the particular XUV wavelength at which you're looking. OK. Um, so this is still ongoing. Uh, we've recently submitted it to physics of plasmas. Uh, we joke, jokingly refer this, to this as being the holy work. And uh, what's even more comical is that if you actually do line outs through these things, it looks a bit like an angel. Uh, so this is the holy work. And uh, hopefully we'll actually get this published fairly soon. It's quite nice because the pressures, again, here are very high. They're in excess of 200 megabars at the point where you're kind of seeing this ring light feature, and of course, in the center, they're even higher. Um, something else you can look at is uh, you can actually set up targets where you will get Rayleigh-Taylor instability being driven uh, essentially by radiative cooling. Um, so I'm not going to drag you through all the history of this too much, but basically what we found is we found this almost completely by accident. Um, 
my colleague who was at Rutherford, Kate Lancaster, but is now at York, uh, she was having quite a lot of difficulty explaining some results from an experiment where they were basically heating a, a target which consisted of a relatively thick, meaning maybe 25 or 50 micron, plastic layer with a very thin copper layer on the back. And uh, they were looking at the back surface of the target and seeing how far it moved. And what they found is that it was moving some stupid distance relative to the kind of general trend of the other data. Um, so anyway, Kate and I sat down and talked about this. And this copper layer is very, very thin. And because it's copper and so it's an intermediate Z material, it will also radiate a lot more efficiently at these temperatures than plastic will. So uh, we came up with this idea that maybe what's happening is that the copper's cooling down very, very quickly. It's remaining relatively dense. And then the hot plastic, which is sitting next to it, which is now a much higher pressure, but it's less dense, it's now basically Rayleigh Taylor unstable with that copper layer. And so it's kind of bubbling through the copper. So what you're seeing then is not really uh, the copper moving, which would require you to have some stupid temperature all the way up here, but you're actually looking at plastic moving, which brings the temperature down to a much more realistic level. So we somehow managed to publish that. Then we tried to do this experiment where we actually tried to make it happen. So we actually started off with, oh, the press there. Um, so then we actually tried to make it happen by starting off with a target that actually has a sinusoidal ripple imposed on it to start off with. And one of the main difficulties was finding someone that can manufacture a high, high quality sinusoidally ripple target, uh, which is only about one or two microns thick. Anyway, uh, we managed to do that. So Cranfield University, who make a lot of microwave electronics and things like that, uh, were able to do that for us. And what we were able to demonstrate was actually the highest rate of rayleigh taylor growth that at the time we did this experiment has ever been seen. Uh, so this is around 10 times higher than you would get in a typical long pulse laser uh, driven target. Okay, so I'll try and shift on because I realize I'm, I'm running out of time. So um, this is another experiment done with TIFR. So here what we found was um, essentially it's the same kind of experimental geometry, but now we're looking with a really high temporal resolution. Um, and what we found is that if we look in this region here, so in this region, only around two picoseconds in duration, we found that there was an oscillation, all the, all the people at TIFR found there was this oscillation in the probe reflectivity. Um, in addition, there's also, we then found an oscillation in the Doppler shift. Um, so myself and Alex Robinson at the Rutherford lab, uh, we sat down and we puzzled over this. And I came up with the idea that maybe what we've got here is essentially a sound wave moving very rapidly down this density contour, because that would generate a profile exactly like this. Um, Alex then set about trying to model this and found that you could actually get this to happen. But you might wonder, well, why on earth are you generating this sound wave? And also a sound wave that's strong enough that you can see it using this kind of Doppler spectroscopy effect. And uh, it turns out, what was going on is something that um, no one had actually realized should happen before, which is this. I'll draw it on the board um, because I think it's clearer. I'm trying to explain it from here. Um, essentially, so as I said before, if you have a short pulse laser, or, well, normally has a pre-pulse, so what, what you're actually firing into, you shoot onto a solid target, um, is a kind of a density profile that looks something like that. So this is being... This, exponential profile has been created by the pre-pulse. Now the pre-pulse has, you know, maybe a temperature profile, induces a temperature profile that looks something like that into the plasma. But what happens when you now crank up the intensity? Well, if you now turn the intensity up by about five or six orders of magnitude, initially, I mean, the plasma doesn't really move a great deal. I mean, that's, you may think I'm contradicting myself, but it doesn't move a lot. But now the temperature has suddenly risen by this. 
And the thing is, beforehand, this thing was basically in hydrodynamic equilibrium, if you like. So you have a temperature profile like this and an uh, exponential density ramp uh, that kind of sat well with that. But now what you've done is you've created a situation that's unstable. Because you now got, if you imagine that rather than having this fall off, you've now got, say, some region here, which is all about the same temperature, then that will mean that the pressure gradient here is much steeper than the pressure gradient here, which means that you'll be accelerating the fluid here more strongly than the fluid here, which means that you'll get a traffic jam-like effect, which is that the material up here is wanting to move faster than the material down here, so it will start to pile up. But as soon as it piles up, it reduces the density gradient, and so it then piles up a little bit further upstream, and so on and so forth, and so now you've generated the sound wave. So that was the idea, and we made it work in a simulation as well, so uh, we then submitted it to PRL and they were happy with it. Okay, so that was that. Um, now, finally, since this is a laser plasma accelerator workshop, um, I have only been peripherally involved in this, so I do apologize if my understanding of it is somewhat limited. Um, but essentially, this is looking at uh, QED effects in a scenario. So this is not anything to do with what I've just been talking about, really. Or if it is, I haven't thought about how it is. Um, what we're talking about here is uh, lasers with extremely high intensity in excess of around 10 to the 23 where you start to get some uh, processes uh, that you don't see with the kind of int intensities that we currently have available in the lab. So in a few years' time, for instance, this Eli will be pushing up into this kind of intensity regime, and so we're interested to know what will happen. And of course, this is quite interesting for those working on laser plasma accelerators, because this is exactly the kind of regime you might want to go into if you want to push a slab of plasma really hard, using, say, radiation pressure or hole boring or light cell or whatever. However, if you get up to these kind of intensities, uh, some new phenomena can start to occur. Um, the one that we're looking at here is the nonlinear Compton effect, uh, which is essentially that you get uh, gamma rays spraying out transversely um, as your electrons are accelerated in the field of the laser. And these gamma rays then produce electron-positron pairs, which are also sitting in the field of the laser. So then you get a cascade of electron-positron pairs, and you get what's known as a pair cascade, which very, very rapidly uh, and dramatically increases the density of the plasma that's essentially acting or being excited by the laser. And you can actually get this electron-positron pair plasma up to a sufficiently high density that it will start to draw, it will go above the relativistically corrected uh, critical density of the laser and will actually start to quench the laser field, which will also kill off the acceleration of the particles. So if you want to think of it in, I mean, the kind of conventional accelerator wisdom or laser plasma accelerator wisdom is that you can only go up to a certain intensity in a conventional accelerator because if you go over that, then you'll get breakdown. Well, you could look at this in a slightly similar way that if you go over a certain intensity in a plasma, then you'll start to generate uh, a pair plasma, which will effectively also have that effect of breaking down the process that you're trying to use to drive your target. Um, so, I didn't do these simulations myself. I was only kind of peripherally involved in some of the interpretation and understanding of what's going on here. Um, so I've pretty much verbatim put into bullets, which I do apologize for, a description of the simulation and what was actually done here. So it's essentially a PIC code, though. Um, and what we found, I'll basically focus on the findings. If you understand this stuff, you're welcome to read it. Um, is that we found that if you include these QED effects, you get quite a, note the axis isn't going down to zero, for example, uh, that you actually get quite a dramatic reduction in both the peak energy of the uh, particles that you're producing uh, by this uh, hole boring acceleration mechanism, and also the efficiency 
uh, suffers quite a deleterious effect as well. Uh, if you have any questions about this, this is the email address of the first author. I apologize if it seems slightly cheeky, but as I say, this isn't really my bag, but given that I'm actually at least in some way somewhat involved in this paper, I thought I should, this is Max Halloway's conference, I thought I would at least mention it. Uh, so that's kind of it for the experiments. I'm trying to keep the time, I've got a bit of time. Um, so in the future, what we're, uh, so well, of course that isn't an experiment, that's a simulation, but um, moving on into the future, one of the main problems here is that uh, doing these kind of experiments on large facilities actually gets more challenging, um, in large part because, uh, well, I mean, I've for many years been doing experiments on both large and small facilities. The facilities that we use, for instance, at TIFR, um, you don't get very large electromagnetic pulses being generated by the interaction. Um, when you go to a facility such as Petawatt, uh, Rutherford, or a larger facility, you start to get very large EMP effects, which tend to mess around with your diagnostics. I once remember a, a fateful day when we had a group of people come over from Livermore to do an experiment, and we blew up 200,000 pounds worth of cameras in the space of, well, about half a picosecond. Um, <laughs> which didn't cheer them up very much. So it's a far more challenging environment to actually work in if you're trying to go to these larger facilities to do these kind of experiments. But of course, that's a direction that we need to go in um, if we really want to get into a fast ignition relevant uh, regime. Um, myself, uh, Ravi Kumar at TIFR and Alex Robinson have been invited to write a review article by Physics Plasmas on this, which we're currently in the process of putting together. Uh, that's about it. I'm not going to torture you anymore with this stuff. Does anyone have any questions? regularly see a situation in which the electrons move and the ions don't move, uh, although it's not particularly well described by most hydrodynamics codes. So if you're using a, a PIC code, you can very easily see effects like that. Um, I mean, typically the electrons will move first and then they drag the ions uh, along after. Um, it, it can do, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mainly work with pure hydrodynamic codes. What kind of effects are you particularly interested in? I mean, you get all kinds of effects of that nature. I mean, for instance, you just, sorry? Focusing of the laser beam. Um, I myself haven't looked at that. It may happen, I'm not sure. The, the effects I'm more familiar with are, for instance, what happens in a shock wave where you can get a separation between the ion and the, the electron uh, population, so you get a plasma shock. Um, but in terms of focusing of the beam, uh, we've mainly looked at these resistivity gradients in terms of trying to control the distance. So uh, I, there may well be an effect such as you described. So, um, as you know, uh, if you have a very low uh, background plasma density, then a laser can essentially propagate through unimpeded. Um, if you start raising the density such that it approaches the critical density, which of course in this case is a very high intensity laser, you need to correct that critical density for the relativistically increased mass of the electrons. Um, then the electrons can start to oscillate in the laser field. And when they do that, they draw energy out of the laser field. So essentially the mechanism is that your laser field is being quenched, so it's, it's disappearing because all the energy is being drained out of it by this pair plasma which has been created from the gamma ray cascade in the presence of the accelerating field of the laser. There are no more questions. Let's thank John for this excellent talk.